Good morning, would you believe it is the first day of September? I'm finding it quite difficult to deal with, but because it is the first of September, new month, we're kind of entering into autumn, I thought it would be quite a good opportunity to do a bit of a plot tour and see where we stand now. Things are looking very, very different from last year at this time. Uh, although, having said that, about a month ago they were even more different. Do you remember the comparison photos? Like, that was nuts. Everything has greened up a lot since then, since we started getting the rain. But it is different. Like, we've got um, the things that were really successful last year, like the beans, have just been pretty much a ooh this year. But that's how it goes. So I figured we'll just do a whiz round the whole plot and look at where we stand going into autumn. Good place to start up with you girlies, huh? Should we start with you, those girls? Huh? So plot tour <laughs> of the girlies. Hey, having a nice time? Yeah, they are beautiful girls. This is something I'm really pleased about. <laughs> this is my garlic chives that completely died off uh, for the first time ever and it's come back beautiful. Something else that's come back beautiful after a huge chop back is the mint, looking gorgeous. Hey girly whirlies, beautiful mint, yes. This is the pineapple mint. Gorgeous. Hey, <laughs> what do you want, girlie? Huh? Pineapple mint. Apples that are hanging above them. The ones that the girls haven't managed to jump up and knock off are looking really good. Quite pleased with them this year, actually. We didn't get any off this tree last year. And we have got, let me just get around this side. Yeah, so we've had about four off here and we've got another, maybe three really good ones. This one's um, a bit sad, but still pretty good. Mulberries have been good this year as well, although we haven't had as many as we would have liked because although I chopped the whole tree right back and with the full intention of covering it, what have I not done? I've not covered it. So although if we're quick, we get the berries, um, it's not having a huge harvest like last year. Although the tree itself seems to have responded really, really well to the chop back because look, beautiful new growth. Not so lovely. Actually, these are the dwarf French beans that I sowed and the ones that have stayed in place look fantastic like these. I mean, ignore the fact that there's phacelia just coming up everywhere. But the ones that have actually not been dug up look fantastic, but the majority of them look like this, which is really sad. Although, look, they are starting to kind of come back underneath, but it's a bit of a shame. That's what this trellis is on here for, by the way, is to stop them being dug up, hopefully, although it doesn't appear to have worked. This poor little chap. I'd say about a third of them, maybe a quarter of them are still in place, so we should still get some sort of a crop out of them. On the corner of this bed, this is the bed that I moved recently, I've got all these herbs in here which used to be in the bed next to the barbecue. So it is curly leaf parsley, flat leaf parsley, thyme under there, and then the chives. So where the barbecue is, been moved to over there. The two beds that are on either side of it are what used to be kind of in this position and that's why it's in like the little rectangle in the corner, the herbs, so I do have to shift them out. This is the bed that's going to be moved like the same as that one has but I've just left it for the moment because it has got all of the self-seeded flat leaf rocket in it which is looking good and also I still had loads of beetroot in the bed so I'm leaving the bed in place while we're harvesting this beetroot because it's actually looking pretty good. We've had a lot out of this patch and there's still tons coming. Potatoes, on the other hand, not such a great harvest. We wait and see what's in these. But if it's anything like what was in the previous two bags, I would say nothing. <laughs> this is a sweet dahlia though, look at this one. A white cactus. This is just like in a really sad pot outside the greenhouse. I really must plant it in the ground. Not a success this year. The cucumbers that I grew at home have been fantastic. The ones in here I was just too late and that is about all we've got. Same with the melons, just it was too hot in here when I planted them out. This one's trying to have a second go at life, but I just don't think it's happening. <laughs> uh, white everlasting sweet peas. Up here on the bench though, stuff's coming along really well. We've got the basil, the fennel, a couple of sporadic leeks that aren't going to do anything. Loads of green pak choy to plant out. I've got the uh, cabbages and purple sprouting broccoli that need to go out. These are more cabbages, but they're going to be grown as more kind of spring greens than hearting cabbages. We've got some more chard to go into the polytunnel. Spinach had pretty poor germination, but what has come up looks really strong. Ah, well, this is meant to be red and green chicory, although the green chicory appears to have been eaten. Is there a slug under there? No. OK, well, that was a pot full of green chicory up until yesterday. Never mind. <laughs> Some more dahlias that need to go in behind here. Ah, oh, the dill. 
So you watched me plant this out very diligently last week with my little pencil dibber. You wait to see what's happened to that little patch of ground. I'll give you two guesses. <laughs> in preparation, I've also got the old Greg's seafood box in here, the polystyrene box that we're going to be growing some lettuces in. Oh, my sea cranby, the uh, sea kale, really needs to find a home in a bed. That is like priority for spring this year. Really is, must get it in the ground. Swing seat area. <laughs> As you can see, I don't have the full quota of cushions on there yet today. But this bed is the one that's gonna be moved. So the swing seat will be shunted over slightly towards the greenhouse. So it's not gonna be quite so close to the barbecue. So it's not a danger to being set on fire when you're barbecuing and swinging at the same time. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Got all these dahlias in here that we didn't really know how they were gonna turn out, so they're just in small pots. But now we can see that they're gonna be magical, although some of them still haven't flowered yet, so we don't know. But they are going to be planted out either in the flower bed next to the pond or into the actual dahlia bed. Look at that gorge. Behind that is the asparagus bed, and look how brown it is. At this time of year, it's supposed to be starting to go this fantastic, like golden color and all glowing and wonderful. Um, but instead, uh, the heat's just done for it and it's basically just a pile of sticks, which is a bit of a shame. But underneath, this is the other patch of garlic chives, which actually seems to have uh, survived as well. Is that? No, uh, that's grass. <laughs> Ignore that. That's not garlic chives, but this is garlic chives. I can't tell you how pleased I am that they've come back. There's the other one over there because they were completely gone. Runner beans. We have had a lot of misshapen runner beans this year. Uh, the early ones were all like this, a real pain, and then they're not nice, you know, they're really gnarly to eat and they're really stringing and horrible, but they are starting to come good like this now. So this late in the year, it's extraordinary, this late in the year, we're starting to get a good harvest of runner beans. Never been that late before, uh, but hello. <laughs> Look at my trombocinos. Are they not something alien and gorgeous? I'm so looking forward to trying them. Look at their beautiful tendrils. I'm so happy with those. Asparagus just on the other side of it. Look at this, We've because it was so hot and dry, we had that burst of rain and it started sprouting again. Should be well over all that silliness. The rhubarb desperately needs some help. I've got to dig it out and separate it because it's just it's so impacted in there. The strawberry bed was a complete fail this year because they were all dug out early on. Tree spinach though, self-seeded itself in here and that's been brilliant. We've also got a sort of a random chard in the corner there, but strawberries, we're just not a go, or we're gonna to have to rethink that next year. Something else that wasn't great is the arches up this side. This is where my purple, gold, and green French beans should have been the climbing ones. But when I first planted them out, we had an issue that the slugs came over from next door and just munched them off. And when they started to regrow, the uh, foxes or badgers, whichever one it's, I think it's foxes on this side, just kept digging them out. This is another one, just, re just repeatedly pulled them out of the ground in that incredible heat and they just burnt to a crisp. So I have just completely accepted defeat. The young asparagus bed is actually faring a lot better than the old asparagus bed. These still look pretty lush. We have got some gladioli hiding in there and also, a bit late, the zinnias have started flowering. I mean, they should have been flowering for so long by now, but you know, it's a one of those years. One success we have had on the bean front this year, though, is the bellottis are looking brilliant. Look at the colour of that. We've got tons of them, so these will be dried on the vine or on the plant as long as it doesn't get too wet, and then we will freeze them. Uh, but yeah, tons, tons of them, which is so satisfying because all the rest of the beans basically have been a complete fail. <laughs> Asparagus looking pretty there with the little baubles. But yeah, excellent on the bellotti bean front. In fact, the Bellotti beans have uh, decided that they're going to grow up the asparagus as well. Rampant little chaps. Perennial brassica bed. I've been so impressed. I transplanted a load of these chaps like this one and the two behind it are tree cabbages and I turfed them out of their original spot and they have survived. This I've got some extra legs to put in the middle because it's a bit like a Boeing ship at the moment, but what's inside is safe. So that's really what matters. And yeah, these were moved in like the really hot weather and they survived. So I'm pretty chuffed about that. And these are the nine star broccoli that are also looking strong. The verbena, that is something that has adored the weather we've had this summer. Hidden amongst this mass of marigolds, if I can just get my head through the side of the arch, is my Ichikokuri. I've just given it a bit of a chop back, which is why it looks a bit bare. But we have got about, I think I counted seven fruit coming on here. 
which is brilliant. The crown prints haven't done so well, so we're sort of relying on them as our main pumpkin this year. Leeks are looking fantastic buried under there. Really pleased with them. Uh, we've got a bit of a bean here, which has sort of survived, but not really doing very much. There's another squash there sitting in the grass. This is the only arch which does have something growing up it up this side, and that is the achocha. So this poor plant has suffered the same as the beans, but the beans just couldn't cope. Just kind of gives you an idea of how tough the achocha are. We had one early picking of a load of them, and then it completely stopped when it kept getting dug out, but now it's kind of resettled. So we should get a late load of those, which is excellent. The bed that that arch is in has been all a bit all over the place. We had some really good onions out of this bed earlier, but I ended up just, uh, you know, I planted those tomatoes really, really late. I just plonked them in here to see if they would do anything, but I don't think they're going to. It was meant to be the parsnip bed, but as you can see, we've actually only got about six parsnips in here because as they were germinating, something just came along and ate them off, which was brilliant. Last year, it was the chickens that did that to us. This year, it was an unknown creature, probably a slug. <laughs> fruit cage is living up to its name at the moment it is absolutely bursting with raspberries these ones are all like tumbling out the side really need to do something to rein them in a bit <laughs> you can see look there's just tons of red in there i'm so surprised because raspberries really normally like a lot of water and that's not something they've had this year but they seem to have just i put that huge amount of leaf mold on top of them earlier in the year and i think that's made a massive difference gooseberries need a good taming they need to be tied in the two currant bushes, you remember this is the black currant uh, that I planted earlier this year, really suffered in the heat. Black currant, not as much as the red currant. Look at this. Didn't matter how much I watered it in that 40 degrees heat, it is just gone. I don't think there's any saving that, which is a real shame. They're just so vulnerable in their first couple of years, you know, even though they're such tough bushes. Like you, Berta, you're a tough old bush, aren't you? <laughs> she needs a new cardigan desperately little bit of wood storage up here for some projects which are coming up in the autumn. The apricot tree. Now you remember I covered this with netting uh, earlier to try and protect some of the apricots. Well we got a fantastic harvest of apricots this year but what I haven't done is got round to taking the netting off so I really need to do that. Have a look at this. How cute is this? I love this rose. I think it's called New Dawn and it just plugs away under here in the shade quite happy. Figs is going to be a problem. We had no figs early in the summer and they didn't get the benefit of the heat. And a lot of these ones are going to be too big to survive the winter without rotting, but not big enough to actually ripen this year. So we're going to be in a bit of a pickle with that. Badger defences still going strong. Bay tree needs a bit of a haircut. I need to strip its lower stems and sort it out at the top. The winter savoury is smelling a divine. The lettuces that I planted out on this end here have been dug out so many times that I think they've just fried, which is, you know, a delight and seems to be a bit of a theme at the moment. Nothing inside this box has been dug up though, it's been protected, so the pat choy are looking really good, the ones that didn't get eaten by the slugs. <laughs> Look at that colour, it's magnificent. I've kind of infilled where the slugs got them with the green ones, so they'll be a bit slower and the mustard greens are coming on. Lettuces on this side fared a bit better at that end, but yeah, they've been got at this end. Compost area, all looking pretty tidy, apart from the fact that I've stacked loads of rubbish up here. We've got bin one, two, and three. I need to sort out my sticks. I need to cover this box in netting. <laughs> but my Jerusalem artichokes are looking fab. Look at these, they look so strong. I'm really chuffed about that. Pear tree survived the heat. I was worried about it. This one and the cherry tree kind of were new in last year, so they were quite vulnerable. But we've even got pears on it, which is amazing. These are the crown prints, the other pumpkins that I'm going. You can see they're only just really starting to kick off and I just don't think they're gonna have time to do anything. Sorry, chaps, didn't mean to break it to you like that. This is the other uh, fairly new tree we've got on the plot. The cherry tree survived absolutely fine. I am chuffed, but look at this. This looks like grass has spread in here. It's not grass. It's an absolute mass of Californian poppy seedlings. That's gonna be nuts. <laughs> also another mass, but this isn't Californian poppies. This is just weeds. Lettuces that didn't get dug up are looking pretty good at that end. Turnips are coming along nicely. You can just see, can I get my head in there and see? Yep, got a bit of white forming under there. Can you see there? And uh, down this end, we got some more happening. Woohoo, sprig onions. I direct sowed uh, two different varieties. One was white Lisbon, which are these ones on the end, and also 
Holland Blood Red, which I thought hadn't come up at all because they were so slow. But as you can see now, they're looking fantastic. They were just way, way slower to germinate. Sorry, just ignore the fact that I've got grass growing in there as well. <laughs> and the dahlias. The dahlias have been nowhere near as good as normal this year. I mean, look at the size of this head. Yeah, that is normally, so what's that like? The width of my hand. Yeah. Normally, you can't put your hand around it. It's like that big. It's normally a whopper, like huge, like that. They're tiny. I mean, they're beautiful, but they're just so small. These guys are fine. Constant buffet for the bees. Hey, little chap. <laughs> I love these open dahlias. They're happy single, I think this one's called. It is gorgeous. That's a bit crowded. Move on to your own one. There you go. I love it when they get these little streaks. Isn't that beautiful? Again, this is our bog standard one we've got on the plot. And normally that flower's massive. Teeny tiny. Tiny dahlia flowers this year. These ones are looking good. So I've got this one, which is the orange one. And I have a lilac one, the same, which just look at this. It never did anything this year. That's as far as it's got. Isn't that weird? Oh, it doesn't help that it keeps getting dug out like everything else. And my tulip bulbs. And <sighs> This is the bed that we prepped last week for uh, being our covered bed. So I planted out the little kohlrabi. Hello, Chapo. Doing well. This was the um, scatter sown self-seeded chimada wrapper that was being attacked by the birds even though we haven't got a net over the top of this you can see like this was sewn all across here and you can see the difference inside the cage and out this used to be my next wave of beetroot you can see I, a couple of them survived but they just all got turfed out of the ground so so what have i got like three left in that row brilliant that was worth it the lamb's lettuce that i sowed has come up though despite being dug up the first time they seem to have recovered and also i've got a bit of chicory growing in there so I'll transplant those out that's nice the pond I'm doing a bit of work on the pond at the moment uh, we've got a lot of flag irises in the pond and we just don't want them anymore they cause too much of a problem they're supposed to be in their little baskets but they formed like a huge mass so we are keeping a lot of this stuff and obviously the water lily and the rushes we're just going to get rid of the uh, flag irises because they're a pain but that's the job we're sort of halfway through at the moment. The wildflower patch on the side has ended up being just mostly rocket, which I'm not complaining about. I mean, it's not as beautiful as the uh, wildflowers, but they just got burnt off and the rocket survived. So that's how it goes. And at least it's edible. The Lucullus chard is doing really well under this EnviroMesh. But look, I just really funny. You've got these tiny ones. They were all sown on the same day, all planted out on the same day. And you've got all those tiny ones and then one massive whopper. Why does that happen? <laughs> that was a beast. Courgettes are a bit of a sad tale. The ones that have stayed in the ground are doing really well, but the, these poor things, they just keep being dragged out. I mean, look, at that one's out of the ground again. <laughs> Don't worry, mate, I'll bury you in a second, I will. But I mean, that one's come out so many times, there's no hope for it, really. This one's only come out three times, so it might have a bit of life left in it. The rest of them have been producing loads of courgettes. I mean, they're coming really nicely, but it's just such a shame. The rhubarb chard is coming on really nicely in the end of this bed even if the other end is a bit of destruction. Courgettes on this side though, since we put the uh, this wire mesh over the top of them, they haven't been disturbed again, which is a bonus because these are, these are the yellow patty pans at this end, which I think are called a sunburst or something. Green patty pans, Patterson Gagat at this end. They're all looking fine. The courgette on the other side that was dug up isn't looking fantastic, but you know, more charred on the end of the bed. Again, where we were going to have the wildflowers, uh, it's mainly rocket. <laughs> Seems to have been the only thing that sort of survived in here. You can see how deep these holes are that they dig. Look at this. Let me see if I can show you how deep that is. Stick my hand in there. Like, can you see that? It's like the whole height of my hand deep. Sage is looking gorgeous. The uh, oregano looks good after it's a bit of chopped back. The chives are looking good. The hyssop looks beautiful. That's just finished flowering and it was stunning. We have got marigolds coming out of our ears over here. These are self-seeded ones and look, <laughs> look how many we've got coming on here. I'm going to dig them out and try and hold on to them for next spring. It's exciting. Rosemary's looking good. The thyme on this side is looking fab. Inside the polytunnel, the Thai basil that didn't get dug out is looking really, really nice. We've got aubergines coming now. Fab. And some of these tomatoes are looking beautiful. I mean, look at that, isn't that gorgeous? I said last week, like we have not had the tomato season that we would have expected to have. 
but I'm not like that disappointed. A lot of people last year didn't get any tomatoes because of the blight. And we didn't think we were gonna get any this year because of whatever that was that happened to our tomatoes early on, although mm, that doesn't look great. But yeah, this hasn't been the tomato season of my dreams, I'm not gonna lie, but we have had some tomatoes, which is so much better than I was expecting that actually it turns out I'm quite chuffed with them, really. I think they've done a great job from recovering from all that drama and we had drama with the peppers as well. And look at that, we're just getting our first sort of sign of peppers approaching. <laughs> I know it's September, but I live in hope. I live in hope. If the weather continues to be good, although it's pretty gray today, if the weather continues to be good, these plants have got quite a bit of life left in them yet. Green chicory, this stuff has been fantastic. One of my favorite vegetables. Next up from them, I planted a load of tatsoi and some more of the kohlrabi because I had excess of them. So they are just in there with a bit of net over them to try and deter. <laughs> Tree spinach looking wonderful. This is the second load of beetroot. These are looking really good. They've got that cloche on them, not for heat protection, but just you know to try and dissuade them from being dug up. But they're looking brilliant, so I'm really pleased about that. Talking of dug up, <laughs> the incredibly long-suffering Cavalanero is, I'm amazed that they're still looking like they're alive because that one's been dug out again in the centre. The two on that end have been dug out so many times, I can't tell you. <laughs> These are the most long-suffering Cavalanero. are oh, just poor chaps, I'm so sorry. You're doing such a good job at recovery every couple of days. It must be hard. Look at this on the end here, just the, this is just the trombuccino that's growing over the book. How fluffy it is! Isn't that gorgeous? And we've got little trombuccinos, baby ones. <laughs> Although it seems to be trying to climb over my Cavalanero um, defense system, not functioning defense system, but you're supposed to be going up here, chap, up the arch, dear. This is a project for the next month or so. We've cleared this is our side access, we've cleared it. I'm going to put a gate in there probably using some of this, which was some of my home-based bargain wood. Hey, girly whirlies. Sorrel has recovered brilliantly from me cutting off all its flower heads. That's done really, really well. The Bietta, the perpetual spinach is looking fantastic. The ones in the center there that uh, were turfed out have recovered brilliantly, so I'm really thrilled about that. But just prepare yourself for what's on the other side of these. Do you remember where I planted all that beautiful dill? All really carefully with my pencil. Look at this. Like, how many are left? I must have planted like 300 of them <laughs> and I've got about six left in the ground. Mm. <laughs> the tatsoi is still under their box though, although whoever's been digging has been having a go at the side of that box. <laughs> oh, I can't tell you how annoying that is. I'm gonna put some dill in some pots. <laughs> Tree spinach looking fantastic over here. It's just starting to go to flower, so I'll probably strip that off. And some more marigolds, which have been surprisingly good this year after frying. And my little goji berry from Kay. It's producing berries, which is exciting. A zinnia. Yeah, girlies, zinnias. I know you like the zinnias, don't you? Yeah. Really the last bed down this side is the one that is the carrot bed that we grew the coriander in, which I lobbed off all of the flower stems the other day. It seems to be coming back quite well. Carrots are looking fab, but they do have um, carrot aphid, which is a bit annoying. So I don't know how long they're gonna last. And yes, girlies, we've done the full circuit girls. We're back to you. We are, we are. And that's how we're going into autumn. So uh, not too bad actually. Not too bad at all. Shame it's a bit of a grey day. It would have been better to do a plot tour in the sunshine, wouldn't it? But beggars can't be choosers. And now I've got to go and watch Lauren get married. Do you remember Lauren? Lauren, uh, we went to Blue Dot Festival with Lauren. We also went to Northern Ireland with Lauren. Anyway, she's getting married tomorrow. So I better get home, get showered, get on the train and head off. And I will be back on Sunday to do the Q&A. <laughs> There's been a long time coming and I've got reams of questions, so I'm not going to get through them all on Sunday. But we'll do a part of them and then I can do a couple next week and, you know, spread them out. Anyway, I better get going.
made it to the hotel room. Excellent. Now, okay, shower has been had, uh, except this is a bit of a worry, but hopefully it'll just dry and look like it normally does. <laughs> Okay, I have a dress on. <laughs> uh, I think it's time to go. We made it back to the hotel last night, which is a bit of a bonus. And uh, yeah, instant coffee with long life milk. What more could a girl want of a morning? <laughs> I'm showered and up and fresh. Um, just found out it's gonna be a little more difficult to get home than expected. So we're not out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's quite close to the middle of nowhere, but it's not that, I mean, we're just outside Oxford. Um, Didcot, well, we're not in Didcot, we're in Grove, and we want to get to Didcot to get the train uh, back to Paddington. So on our way here, obviously we got the bus, which was the X36, I think. Um, so I just looked up the times of the bus today. So we got to check out of here at like 10, which is what, we've got a couple of hours. It's not a rush, but we've got to check out of here at 10. And um, I've just looked up the bus times and uh, take no buses. Turns out they don't have buses on Sundays, or at least they don't have the X36 on a Sunday. I mean, what's all that about? Like nobody wants to move anywhere on a Sunday. Anyway, means that the journey home is gonna be a bit more tricky. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of options, none of them good. Also Bolt and Uber don't work out here, so <laughs> I'll see what Alex and Elliot come up with. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, we eventually got a cab. It took like an hour, <laughs> but we got there. But this, chaps, is the train we're supposed to be on. Alas, we and our luggage are still on the platform.
and we're back on the swing seat of pure joy <laughs> actually that's going to make us all feel sick if i keep doing that i'll stop uh yeah lauren is a married woman and i am back on the plot uh ready to answer questions so, so we had questions coming in across a whole range of things there was on discord on patreon on the youtube comments from the community post and also on instagram so there was a whole array of questions and there's far too many for me to be able to answer in one afternoon uh, so i've just picked some out around them i printed a load out um and i've kind of just selected some there was quite a lot of uh questions which obviously kind of like were connected <laughs> like the same sort of questions and one of the ones that comes up every single time i have a q a or in fact at pretty much every video somebody asks about lily the cat so i'm just going to clear that one up initially i had about 10 questions about lily lily isn't my cat uh, <laughs> she just hangs out on the allotment she's a gorgeous cat she's really really well looked after as you can tell from how she looks she's just splendiferous um, she is uh, microchipped and well looked after. She's just an outdoor cat and she happens to uh, live on the allotments. She has an owner, uh, she has a place to sleep, but she's not mine. <laughs> she's just not my cat. But yeah, she hangs around with us. She's not actually here today. She hasn't shown up because she is uh, fawned over by pretty much everybody on this site. So she just kind of picks and chooses how she, who she hangs around with. Uh, and it's not us today. So yeah, that's Lily's story. She's not mine. She's just lovely. The other question that came up a lot, which I'm actually going to chicken out of and like just not answer it this week and have another week to think about it because there was a load of variations of the question, what's your favourite vegetable? If you were on a desert island and you could only take uh, two packets of seed, what would they be? Um, if you could have only one other thing other than chard and tomatoes, thanks Miles, um, what, what would it be? And do you know what? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea. So that's all of that range of questions I'm going to answer next week. <laughs> Hopefully. I've got to think about it because that's... Well, one question that I can answer that came up uh, three times on the thing or a variation of it came from Sparrows End Homestead and also Mike from Patreon who made my unbelievable sign that's on top of the shed. Let's just have a quick look at that. Yeah, <laughs> so he made that. And the questions were, firstly from Mike was talking about, so let me just get the, get the question right. It was, uh, if you had a choice between a garden in the city or a farm in the country, which one would you choose? And Sparrow End Homestead was, do you have any uh, plans, dreams to have your own place with a garden one day? If so, where would it be and how big a garden would you like? And she was saying that she wouldn't really want more than uh, half an acre because she doesn't think she can handle it. Um, in terms of a city garden or a farm, the only thing that could drive me out of um, London would be the sea. I would live by the sea in a heartbeat if I could. Yeah, I mean, if the opportunity came up for me to go and live by the sea and garden by the sea, um, I would take it. I would. Only like south by the sea. I mean, I absolutely loved Shetland. I thought Shetland was spectacular and basically everywhere is by the sea in Shetland, but I wouldn't want to garden up there, although it's beautiful. Basically, no, I wouldn't leave London. Um, if I had an apps, if I could just choose, I would have a house right in the slap bang centre of town with a half acre garden. <laughs> I can tell you that's not going to happen for me. I've, I've accepted that's not going to happen. Uh, but yeah, I would live right in the middle of London uh, with my half acre garden going down to the Thames, maybe opposite St Paul's, you know. <laughs> That's what I would do if I had a choice. But yes, I do have dreams of having my own garden one day, although I love this allotment dearly. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I really like the, the allotment more than having a garden. Like it's got a whole other aspect to it. It's got like the community stuff and, and you're kind of leaving your house to go to it. But there are times when I just think, ugh. And also like things happen, like when we had the polytunnel stabbed and when we had the shed broken into. And in fact, a set of allotments near us got broken into the other day. So when things like that happen that you just think, God, it would be really nice if it was actually just mine and I could protect it rather than it being so vulnerable, like away from the house. The other thing about it is, and I have had a couple of questions about this over the years as well. I think there was one in this set about how having the YouTube channel or the Instagram or whatever has changed my relationship with the allotment and that's sort of part of it. So being able to garden in a community setting like, why is it 
so many aeroplanes? Why is there so many aeroplanes today? Why is there so many? When you're gardening away uh, in your own garden at home, I think part of what you miss from being in an allotment community uh, or in a kind of communal garden or something is that like interaction with other people but actually you lot and the internet and the amazing kind of like the gardening people online sort of provide that anyway so you're not gardening in isolation anyway if you kind of interactive online with other people gardening and you can show your garden and look at other people's gardens basically yes if I could have my own garden big enough like even if it was just as big as this allotment which is what like 260 square meters uh, I would choose that most definitely. Okay, let's go for a practical question. Lorraine, how do you know when to pick your Crown Prince squash? Well, it's the same, so with all winter squash, uh, the stem that they are attached to the plant, actually, let's go and have a look at the Ichi Kukuri and I can show you what I mean. So the stem that attaches your pumpkin or your winter squash to the plant here. You see how that one's going yellow? When that dries out and is gnarly and looks like an old piece of cork, that's when it's ready. It's when it's kind of severed its connection from the plant and then you just cut it off and then store them upside down for a while um, so that they don't rot and you should be tick. Talking of squash, you know I only did the plot tour, what was it, two, three days ago. It's now the 4th of September, so yeah, like three days ago. Um, and I filmed the Trombuccino. Look how big they are now. Look at that. I mean, that must be five times the size it was four days ago. That's crazy. Anyway, back to the swing seat. Okay, question from Amy. Would you ever grow a loofah? Uh, I have tried growing a loofah. So far, the maximum size I've got to is about yay big. Uh, not very loofah-ish. <laughs> Admittedly, somebody gave me some uh, spare plant, uh, would have been last year, and they, they were just too late. Like, I didn't get them in the ground. I mean, they didn't get any loofahs off them either. Um, but it is definitely something that's on my list to try. The plant grew fantastically, like, but there's just not much in the way of actual loofah. Quite a few questions about the girlies. The two that I remember specifically were from John Riggs and Emma Wood. So by way of names and introductions, let me grab them for you. This is Florence. I know, I know, girly, I know. So this is Florence. This is Ruby. Hey, Rube. She's the boss, big time. They've also been molting. Look at this. They look ridiculous. Whoop, whoop, whoop. What's that all about, girly? Put your, put your neck. Put your neck. And this is Millie. Or Camille, as the case may be. She's, she's gorgeous. I mean, I don't like to have favourites, but yeah, girly. You see, all her little quills are coming back through now. She's... You're getting your neck feathers back again, aren't you, sweetheart? Yeah, she's so Chicken. Yeah, beautiful chicken. That's a beautiful chicken, that is. Go on, down you go. Beautiful chicken. Yes, yeah, so in terms of breed, they are all Pekin Bantams, which is, um, to my knowledge, the only true Bantam, which is like the, the miniature size ones. They have uh, feathered legs, so they look like they're wearing pantaloons, and they're beautiful. We have had all sorts of breeds of chicken. Um, but we were originally given some bantams that were Wyandotte bantams and they were just the loveliest chickens and from that point on we have always had bantams and they're gorgeous and yes we do keep them for eggs because they don't lay anywhere near as much as say some of the big chickens which are kind of designed purely for egg laying. So the main difference being the eggs are really really small, the yolk is a much higher ratio of yolk to white which is they're just beautiful beautiful eggs but they are very small but the other reason we keep them is that their uh, poo is fantastic you know in the compost bin chicken you know chicken manure pellets all that kind of stuff they're, they're just brilliant and also we keep them because they are gorgeous and lovely and we enjoy having them on the allotment so yeah triple whammy there was quite a few questions about the chickens um i hope that kind of answered them broadly i know that um emma and john's questions were specifically about their names which is ruby Roo, flo and the mills um you might recognize those names from a popular tv series <laughs> three lady detectives maybe on a nice island 
anyway yeah and and why we keep them which is basically eggs helping with the compost and because they're a joy question from eli as in in the garden with eli and kate so what gardening jobs do you save for when the camera isn't running too physical too boring too hard always go wrong etc etc <sighs> There's loads of jobs that I don't bother filming. I mean, we're up here for hours and hours and I get like 45 minutes of like film every week. <laughs> Even if some of it's sped up, like <laughs> uh, mowing is constant, constantly mowing and strimming. But then it's a job I really enjoy. But yeah, you don't need to see that because boringness. I do quite a lot of things like planting out when the video is a bit plant out heavy because you know how these things go they go in like big waves so suddenly you find yourself for like three weeks all you're doing is planting stuff out or you're only sewing stuff or you're pruning stuff it kind of goes in that wave well if a video is just entirely made up of me planting stuff out which I know we have had a couple of them <laughs> but I've also not filmed a lot of the stuff that I've planted out I've mentioned it and then I'll mention it again when it's like starting to grow or when something's eaten it or something's dug it up I'll mention it again but yeah I, I find it quite difficult because gardening like by its very nature like it kind of comes in these huge waves getting some sort of balance in the videos is quite difficult when really honestly for that week all you're doing is one particular job over and over again <laughs> and also now I'm entering like this is my third year of making the vlogs I do wonder like I just think sometimes when I'm filming stuff I just think this must be really boring to watch but then I don't find it boring to do and I've done it for the last 10 years every single year so <laughs> maybe it's not I don't know but yeah that's something I'm starting to think of a bit more now actually is that what doesn't need to be filmed because you've seen it before and then I think but then some people only started watching two weeks ago and they don't know about it but oh, I don't know Luckily, my videos are not kind of informative, particularly. They're just kind of, this is what I'm doing now. So I can kind of get away with doing the same thing repeatedly, slightly more than say somebody who's, um, this is how you do this and this is how you do that. Um, because once you've done that kind of video once, it's kind of like ticked off unless you change your technique or you discover some new exciting way of doing something. For me, it is really just kind of like plodding along and then inviting you into the garden with me. So yeah mainly it is just stuff that i just think is just going to be too boring to watch so boring that a bit of tinkly music can't make it interesting <laughs> actually talking of eli a couple of questions namely from uh, philippa and melinda uh, was about having weed seeds in your compost now i know eli does hot bin composting i have never got round to hot bin composting so everything just gets thrown in our compost bin and yeah it's absolutely riddled with weeds but there's a kind of difference so like one of these is it uh yeah philippa actually mentioned specifically like tomato seeds sprouting and stuff but that kind of weed i just don't have a problem with you just hoe them off or pull them out there's no kind of residual problem from them what we're very very careful about not putting in the compost heap are things like bindweed stinging nettle roots got another weed as well which i don't actually know what it's called that forms like this blanket uh, which is a real pest um so we don't put that in the compost bin and we also don't put clover in the compost bin the uh, bulbous clover which we've got quite a lot of because they're just these little tiny bulbules from the roots and then they just spread through everything and then you've got it everywhere but weed seeds i just don't really have a problem with if i could get round to kind of having a go at a hot bin compost um, the hot bin generally kind of kills off the weed seeds, so that's why you end up with really lovely clean compost. Yeah, I'm, I'm not that precious about it. In fact, do you remember in the plot tour where I was showing you the lettuces <laughs> and there was all that weed seed in that corner? Uh, that is from me spreading our own compost on that surface. We just hoe it out like this has been this morning and then they all just like lie on the surface and then they die. I mean, it's, it's better to do this kind of hoeing when you're going to have a couple of days of dry or a lot of sunshine because they can't reroot. They just kind of, you know, burn in the sunshine. But these like half of them maybe re will reroot, but just not very many. And basically, I'm just not very precious about it. This is a bit of an extreme example. It's not normally this bad. <laughs> But like the main way to really avoid that is to make sure that you, um, when you're weeding, you just don't let things go to seed. So if you're kind of weeding things like 
dandelions you just chop them up and you don't let them actually go to go to flower head something i discovered last year actually is i chopped off a load of dandelion heads they were before they'd gone to like tufty stage they were still the yellow flowers picked them all off and threw them in the compost heap and they continued to develop and then when i came up next time the whole top of the compost heap they'd all turned into their tufty things so it just threw the seed nicely through the compost so that wasn't very well thought out <laughs> but yeah avoid getting seed in there by doing the weeding really early don't let things go to seed when you are putting things in there like tomatoes they're not a problem just pull them out i suppose the only time that that can be a real pain in the proverbial is when you're using your own compost to sow really fine seed in and instead of or along with what you do what you've actually intentionally sowed you just get an absolute forest coming up at the same time that can be a problem but so far in my life it's not been a major drama right john hi john uh is asking about mulch um that's a tricky one what's cheap what's freely available what's good i mean we use an awful lot of horse manure here but horse manure is a dicey thing so often uh, it seems to be increasingly contaminated with um, aminopyrrolids and various insecticides and herbicides which obviously isn't something that you want on your plot. Uh, we use a company called uh, Organic Compost Co. Um, I've only actually had a visible problem with an aminopyrrolid uh, contamination once. Um, it was quite severe. <laughs> But sometimes you have to take the risk. The thing that is best that I really love using as a mulch, sorry, it's just getting windy, excellent, um, is leaf mold, uh, which, haha, it is the time for leaf mold right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, just bundling up as much leaf, uh, as much autumn, like fall leaf as you can and mulching that down makes a brilliant mulch. Actually, I think I might have mentioned it in the plot tour that I used like a couple of bags of last year's leaf mulch. So it was only half decomposed it's normally two years it takes sort of generally that's really rough but normally about two years um, for it to become proper compost compost but the first year it's kind of like a semi broken down and it makes a perfect mulch and although there's very very little nutrition in that as a mulch as opposed to the horse manure which is kind of um yeah like just topping up and putting loads into the soil the leaf mold is just kind of bulking up the soil so that it's got much better uh, water retention in my case water retention because we've got really sandy soil so it's building the organic matter uh, in clay soils it kind of helps with lightening up the soil so basically tick all round and I've got to get on um, collecting the leaves because there's a bloke up there George who is uh, an absolute monster with them the moment they start falling he's on it so you've got to kind of fight him for some leaves luckily we've got this oak tree that's right above the shed which which has its own problems like it makes the area really dry and the birds sit in it and poo and all of that kind of thing but uh, it does give us a really really good supply of oak leaves and oak leaves make a really really good leaf mold so we use that but yeah leaf mold excellent everything else like straw you can buy mushroom compost all of those things for mulching mushroom compost costs a fortune although it's brilliant straw i think is just too dangerous it's too dangerous for harboring slugs and things over winter inside the straw so that then they're there ready to get you in the spring um yeah leaf mold if you can make it do because it's brilliant brilliant oh my god there's so many questions <laughs> there are so many questions i'm going to go for one last one which is actually about uh leaving beans to dry on the plants so um who is it from joe so yeah most of the bean plants you're always told just keep picking and they'll keep producing and if you leave them they stop producing which you know is is roughly true but with things like balotti beans greek gigantes any of the ones that you want to dry i've never had a problem like the yield is huge and I always, unless we're going to have really, really soggy, soggy autumn, in which case it can be a bit of a problem, always let them dry on the plant until they're paper dry. You've got to keep a bit of an eye on them because once they get to paper dry, they can just split open and then all your beans are on the floor. <laughs> but if you catch them at the right time, so they're just really nice and dry on the plant, they can survive a bit of rain. It's not like they have to be, it's not like the whole of the autumn has to be dry. But as long as it's not just kind of cold and wet where they can start rotting a bit, going black, 
um, yeah, just leaving them on there. In the question though, actually, you do ask about things like dwarf bolotti beans, and I have never tried drying on a dwarf plant. In fact, the dwarf uh, French beans that I'm trying this year because of the massive uh, climbing French bean failure, uh, it's probably like the only sec the second time I've ever tried dwarf uh, French beans. So I'm not really an expert on that, I'm afraid. Uh, if anybody does know, uh, what the best way of drying beans on dwarf plants are, stick it in the comments below. But yeah, I think, chaps, I think I've rambled on enough. I've got... Oh! Hello! You're, you're here, lady! You showed up? You got bored with whoever you were with, huh? Yeah. I was answering questions about you a minute ago, lady. I was. Beautiful Lil. Yeah. I know. She gets fed by everybody, so she's probably been off having a three-course roast dinner with some other plot holder. <laughs> but yeah, chaps, I think that's probably me rambled on quite enough for today. All that's left is for me to do a cheers when I get home. And I'll see you there. Holy moly, this is going to be a quick cheers, chaps, because this is one long video. So, uh, gin and tonic cheers for the start of autumn the beginning of september uh, also cheers to lauren and graham it was an absolute privilege to watch you get married and also cheers to anybody who's made it to the end of this epically long video i'll see you next tuesday or monday if you're on patreon mm -hmm.